Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the last day of this conference. Uh, before we get started with um, this wonderful panel that we have for us today, we're going to open with a, a prayer by Brother Brent Belknap. Our Father in heaven, at the beginning of this day, we bow our heads before thee and express our gratitude to thee for our many blessings. We are very grateful to participate in this conference. We're grateful for the things that we have been able to learn and to feel. We are grateful for the success of the conference thus far and for the camaraderie and fellowship and, and the spirit that we have felt one with another. We pray this morning for thy blessings to please be on the proceedings of the conference for the rest of this day. And particularly, dear Father, we pray for those who are traveling uh, later today or later on this weekend that they will do so safely. And we ask for these blessings and favors humbly in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> I'm gonna be uh, very brief. We are very lucky to have uh, three judges from the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit with us, with us this morning. Uh, most of us know Judge Griffith. Um, he's a faithful member of this society and he's always extremely accessible and always willing to come and speak uh, with students to come to all the law schools in the area. And we're so grateful for uh, the work that he put in to uh, put this panel together and inviting his, his colleagues. Um, Justice Griffith, many of us know about his distinguished career. Um, he served in both uh, the government. It's not, and it's not quite that distinct, said <laughs> Justice. <laughs> not yet. Not, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, we think it is. Uh, he, he's been in, in private practice, also uh, done government service, and before he came to the court, um, he was the, uh, I guess, assistant to the president and general counsel of Brigham Young University. So we're grateful for all of his service, and, and with that short introduction, I'm going to let you introduce your colleagues Great. and get started. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I, I'm very excited to be here for uh, uh, two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I uh, love the work of the society, and uh, uh, whenever I'm invited, I come. Uh, and that may explain why I'm so far behind in my opinions, <laughs> Chief, Chief Judge. Uh, uh, but the other reason I'm excited is because of uh, the chance I get to introduce uh, my colleagues to you. I'm anxious to hear uh, what they have to say, uh, because they are people of profound wisdom and character. Uh, but I'm also interested in them meeting you uh, and uh, letting them understand a little bit about what the Clark Society is, is about. So, um, uh, so let me introduce my colleagues, Chief Judge Merrick Garland and Senior Judge uh, Lawrence Silverman. Uh, Chief Judge Garland was appointed to the Court of Appeals in 1997 by President Clinton. Uh, he uh, became the Chief Judge of our court just this last week. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College, graduated summa cum laude, first in his class, uh, and from the Harvard Law School, uh, magna cum laude, where he was an articles editor at the Law Review. Uh, he clerked for two legendary judges, uh, Henry Friendly on the Second Circuit and William Brennan on the Supreme Court. Now listen to this line. He left, he left a partnership at Arnold and Porter in Washington, D.C. to become a United States, an assistant United States attorney. It wasn't the other way around. That's re remarkable and tells you something of uh, his character. Uh, as he was principal associate deputy attorney general of the United States, and, and uh, in that capacity, his responsibilities included supervision of the Oklahoma City bombing and Unabomber prosecutions. Uh, Judge Garland and his uh, wife, uh, his remarkable wife, Lynn, who as we speak is skiing at Alta, where the, where, where, the garlands, where the garlands ski every year, uh, he's headed out there soon, uh, are the parents of two daughters. Uh, among Chief Jar Garland's legacies as a judge are his law clerks, many of whom have gone on to cl clerk at the Supreme Court and who serve with distinction in the government, law firms, and the academy. Uh, Senior Judge Lawrence Silberman was appointed to the Court of Appeals in 1985 by President Reagan. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, Judge Silberman's life epitomizes public service. 
He was a partner in distinguished law firms in Honolulu and Washington, D.C., and has been a banker. Uh, he has five times been appointed by presidents to Senate-confirmed positions, five times. He was the solicitor of the Department of Labor, that's one, undersecretary of labor, two, deputy attorney general of the United States, three, obviously a circuit judge, but before that, ambassador to Yugoslavia, a, a renaissance uh, man, if ever there was one. And he's also accepted a host of other appointments in the executive and judicial branches, including serving as co-chair of the President's Intelligence Commission in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Significantly, in 2008, President George W. Bush awarded Judge Silberman the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian award. He's taught courses at Harvard, NYU, and Georgetown, where he is now a distinguished visitor from the judiciary. Uh, the list of his law clerks also reads like a who's who of distinguished lawyers, many having gone on to clerk on the Supreme Court and serving with distinction throughout the nation and around the world. Uh, Judge Silberman and his uh, first wife, Ricky, who, among other uh, accomplishments, founded the Independent Women's Forum, uh, are the parents of three children. Uh, and uh, he, uh, Ricky, passed away in, in 2007, and Judge Silverman has since remarried uh, the lovely and vibrant Patricia, and they are the grandparents of eight children. With that, uh, the order we're going to follow, uh, the Chief Judge requested this, is we'll have uh, Senior Judge Silverman speak to us, uh, then I'll speak for a few minutes, and then Chief Judge Garland, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for you to, to ask questions. So, uh, Judge Silverman. You notice that the chief judge uh, exercised his seniority to go last so he could be uh, in a position to rebut anything said by the two of us. I thought it was a nasty use of seniority. <laughs> but it teaches you a li life lesson. Use every advantage you can anytime. <laughs> but I learned it from a period when I was the junior judge and Judge Silberman was the senior judge. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Well, this is a challenging uh, subject of life lessons. First of all, I, you know, there's something I always tell young people who are considering law school. Never go to law school unless you really want to be a lawyer. The notion that law school is an excellent general purpose education I think is profoundly wrong. Uh, and I've advised over the years young men and women not to do that. I think you're much better off, if you want a general uh, education post-college, to go to business school. And <clears throat> I should always encourage young people to go to law school if they have a calling, a sense that they really want to be a lawyer, and not because they want a general education. We are now seeing, in this recent dramatic drop in the application to the law school because of economic reasons, at what I think would be a very healthy shakeout, because I've been writing for years about the proposition we have too many lawyers in American society. A few years ago, I gave a speech at the University of Minnesota in which I pointed out there were double the number of lawyers per capita in the United States than there were when I graduated from law school, and I don't think that was a healthy thing. Uh, I also thought there was a disproportionate amount of our best talent that had went into law rather than welfare-enhancing uh, positions, a position I, I, I wrote about, and then to my gratitude, uh, Derek Bach, <coughs> the president of Harvard, uh, echoed the same thought in a famous speech he gave at the Harvard commencement. Uh, that's number one. Uh, that's one lesson. Second lesson uh, is that when people ask me for advice on career, I always tell them, just try to do the things you like and do them as well as you can because it's almost impossible to plan out a career. Young people, particularly in Washington, say, well, well, how do you get to be a federal judge or how do you get to be one of the senior positions in the executive branch or whatever else? And the answer is it's, it's impossible to plot these things out. And perhaps I'm being autobiographical because I had such a checkered career. Uh, but I do think it's you, you, the best advice you can give young people is just do what you want to do, do it, and really do it well. And uh, life or God or something takes care of your career. Uh, now, the next lesson I learned 
And I gave a speech on this a few years ago. And it's a very unfortunate lesson I've learned. Uh, I think there's a, been a decline in this country of a concept of honor. You almost never see in the newspapers today an accusation that someone has behaved dishonorably. It's always criminal or something else, but never just dishonorable. And I think my own instinct on that uh, is, is, and this may be a good audience to say it, it's partly in a, a result of decline and, uh, and a notion of faith in this country. Uh, but whatever it is, you don't see the term dishonorable used in accusations or in the newspaper uh, in the way it was 100 years ago, 50 years ago. And I think that's profoundly troubling. It's always whether something is legal. Um, now, when I was Deputy Attorney General at the height of Watergate, I learned something which was also interesting and follows from what I just said. You, there was a general notion in Washington prior to Watergate, it seemed to me, that if a man or woman went into government and they were at the apex of their career or even towards the end of their career and they had an awful lot of money, they were likely to be incorruptible. Whereas young men and women on the make were more subject to temptation. Well, I, as I sat there as Deputy Attorney General during Watergate, I spent a good deal of time talking with Hank Ruth, who was the special prosecutor, first deputy and then special prosecutor. And we would talk over the, what we were learning as the Watergate scandals uh, unfolded. Uh, and as we were prosecuting, or he was prosecuting, and we were supporting a number of people. Um, and the, le the lesson was, it didn't seem to matter whether a man, most of them, were virtually all men, whether a man was at this point in his, his career where you would think he had nothing really to gain but his reputation. And compared to a young person who was desperately trying to get ahead, it didn't matter that people who were at the apex of the career and very wealthy were sometimes easily corrupted. And other young men who had nothing were incorruptible. And I was reminded of the famous Scottish poet who said, a man's a man for all that and all that. And I think what he meant was, the character is inside. And it can never be measured by external uh, wealth or influence. <clears throat> so um, those are the, now, I would as, add one more point, which follows from the, my notion of honor. I thought, and I've also advised people who go into government positions, whether you're under a lot of pressure, that you should always metaphorically have your resignation in your pocket. Sometimes you actually have it in your pocket. Um, and if you're pressed to do something that you believe to be dishonorable, you must be prepared to put that resignation on the table. Uh, it's risky. I did, three times in my career, I did that. Uh, and one time I did it, um, and it subsequently came out in a uh, congressional investigation that I never would have anticipated, and it provided me with an opportunity to be Deputy Attorney General. Otherwise, I never would have been confirmed at the height of Watergate. Um, and so I always advise young people who go into government that you always have to be prepared to resign because there are pressures and sometimes you're put pressed to do something that is very troubling. Uh, and it's particularly troublesome if you're a lawyer in a legal position because sometimes there are political pressures to do something other than straight law enforcement. And that, I think, is the heinous crime of a lawyer in government. You cannot ever allow the government legal procedures to be used for political purposes. 
And those grounds are the ones that you should be prepared to resign on. Um, I suppose the same thing can be true in the private sector, but it's, you don't, I never noticed that kind of pressure in the private sector, but I did see it in government. A young man who was um, in a presidential appointment position in a uh, last administration was a young man who did resign uh, based on pressure to uh, trim on a political case. Um, I was very proud of him, and uh, someday he will be more publicly identified when he is up for another appointment. But in any event, those are the few lessons I've learned. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Judge Garland has asked that I go next. Uh, I, I've got three points that I'll make rather quickly, and then I'll save the fourth one for question and answer because I anticipate somebody will ask a question that will lead to this. Uh, my, my first uh, bit of advice to you is going to be very pedestrian, but I can't give any more important advice, and that is pay careful, careful attention to detail. The big mistakes that I've made in my career as a lawyer, and, I, and I've, I've, I've made some big, big ones, have all come, they've all shared this in common, that I rushed the answer. And the reason I rushed the answer was because I was embarrassed to admit to the partner, or I was embarrassed to admit to the senator, or I'm now embarrassed to admit to my law clerk that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that it, it was going to take me more time to get the answer right. That's embarrassing. You know, we all, we all want to be the one to say, oh, I you know, spent a half hour on it, nailed it, got the issue. And you may be somebody who can do that. I'm, I'm not. Uh, when I've tried to pretend that I'm someone who can do that, uh, I've, it's, it's always, always come back to, to, to haunt me. On the other hand, the things that I've done well in my career, and, and I've done some things very, very well in my career, all of those had in common that I took extra time to get the answer right. That the extra draft, the extra time spent in the library uh, to, to get the answer right. Now that may seem like a, a simple thing, uh, and it is a simple thing, but, it's, but it's, it's important. And the reason I mention it is because it, it's tied up with a sense of, of, of pride in a negative way. Because, the, again, the mistakes I've made, it was because I was embarrassed to admit that I wasn't the quickest, the quickest one there. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Roger Porter sent me uh, a book. Like, like all of us, we're big fans of Abraham Lincoln. And this was James McPherson's book uh, on, on Lincoln as commander-in-chief called Tried by War. Uh, and I read, was into the first couple of pages of it, and I came across this description of Abraham Lincoln, which I had never noticed before. Uh, McPherson writes, Lincoln possessed a keen analytical mind and a fierce determination to master any subject to which he applied himself. This determination went back to his childhood. Among my earliest recollections, Lincoln told an acquaintance in 1860, I remember how, when a mere child, I used to get irritated when anybody talked to me in a way I could not understand. Lincoln recalled, Going to my little bedroom after hearing the neighbors talk in an evening with my father and spending the night walking up and down trying to make out what was the exact meaning of their, to me, dark sayings. I could not sleep when I got on such a hunt after an idea until I had caught it. This was a kind of passion with me and it has stuck with me, end of quote. McPherson goes on to say, later in life, Lincoln mastered Euclidean geometry on his own for mental exercise. As a largely self-taught lawyer, he honed this quality of mind. Now, here's the really important part. He was not a quick study, but a thorough one. Quoting Lincoln, I am never easy when I am handling a thought till I have bounded it north, bounded it south, bounded it east, and bounded it west. Several, McPherson goes on, several contemporaries testified to the slow, but tenacious qualities of Lincoln's mind. The mercurial editor of the, New York, of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, noted that Lincoln's intellect worked not quickly, nor brilliantly, but exhaustively. Now, I love that, I mean, I love that quote. There isn't much that I share in common with Abraham Lincoln, but, uh, but I'm not a quick study either. But if you're not, 
be a thorough one. If you're a quick study, be a thorough one as well. So that's my first and most important bit of advice. Just be careful, pay attention to, to, to detail. Um, when my clerks to come to my chambers, this is actually new now, Zach and Mike. We, don't, we didn't do this before, but they, <clears throat> we just started it this year. I have a couple of my former clerks here who must not have known that I was on the program. Uh, <clears throat> but um, when they come to chambers, the f I give them a gift the first day, and it's a turtle. And they're supposed to put it on their, their desk. And the, the idea is slow down. I, 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 I have an hour rule in my chambers. My clerks are never to apologize for telling me I, I need a little more time, a little more time. OK, that's, that's the big one. Uh, two quick ones. Uh, the next one, be nice to people. And I can't tell you how important this is. Now. Uh, for Christians, we should be nice to people because the Lord told us to be nice to people, okay? Let's just imagine for a second that you care not a whit about uh, what the Lord tells you to do. Well, they, they're different, that's a different issue. We can talk about that tomorrow, right? But, but, but your, problems in that, your problems in that regard. But let's just imagine you don't care about that at all. And the only thing you care about in your life is you and how to get ahead and how to be the most powerful, influential, important wealthiest person you can be. My advice to you is be nice to people. You never know who that person is sitting next to you is going to be. It's a, it's a good, and besides, it's a very good way to live. Uh, last point, uh, pick your mentors very carefully. Um, uh, and you, you don't have all the information you need when doing that. But try your best to be associated with, with good people. In this regard, reading some history is probably not a bad idea. Uh, to, 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 to read history and come up with some heroes. Now, we're not talking about people we put on pedestals. We're talking about people with clay feet and dirty fingernails. We're all humans. We're all in need of God's grace. I understand that. But learn enough about history to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, who the good women are, who the bad women are. That'll help shape your view, you're not going to be working for Abraham Lincoln, right? Uh, you're going to be working for a supervising attorney or a partner, uh, but you want them to be more like Lincoln than otherwise. And you need to know a little bit about, about what's worked in life and what hasn't. So uh, that, those are my three ideas right now. Work, just be very careful about what you do. Be really nice to everybody. Uh, and then uh, finally, be be careful about who you work for and, and, and who's going to teach you and whose example you're going to follow. Well, uh, there are some advantages to going last. Um, <laughs> one is I can draw from the parts of uh, each of my colleagues' uh, talks. Uh, one is that I, will, I, I do get a chance to rebut what Judge Silverman said. And uh, the part that I want to rebut is since all of, I take it this is a law society, right? So it's too late. I assume to take Judge Silverman's advice to not go to law school. <laughs> and that being so, and instead to go to business school. And in that being so, I just wanted to share with you, we had a lunch this week, mm -hmm. which a friend of uh, Judge Griffith's, Clayton Christensen, spoke to us uh, about uh, business and the economy. He's a very well known, you probably know him, he's a very well known uh, professor at the Harvard Business School and a very successful entrepreneur in innovation. He told us one, la one explanation as to why the economy is doing so bad. It's because of what is taught in finance in business schools. <laughs> So the answer is you should be very happy that you didn't go to business school because instead of advancing the efficiency of the economy, you would be retarding it. As to the life lessons, I, I um, take a little bit of uh, what my colleague said. Um, and that is life uh, throws unexpected things at you. And planning your life um, uh, at an early age is uh, not particularly useful in, in a certain way. Um, I love everything Judge Griffith said about Abraham Lincoln. I come from the land of Lincoln, that's Illinois. The name of my town was Lincoln Wood. I went to Todd Hall, Rutledge Hall, and Lincoln Hall as my elementary schools. <laughs> so of course my first desire uh, was I thought, well maybe I'd like to be politician like Abraham Lincoln. 
when I uh, got to uh, college, I thought, no, actually, what I wanted to be was a doctor. And for most of college, I wanted to be a doctor. I found that um, after a while that although I still think being a doctor is a more productive activity and more important for mankind, that I wasn't as good at it as I thought I was going to be. Um, and in the end, I ended up going to law school. And uh, here's where the mentoring stuff kicks in that Judge Griffith is talking about. In law school, your mentors are law professors. So of course, I thought what I wanted to be was a law professor. Uh, in particular, one law professor uh, who's a friend of both Judge uh, Silverman's and mine, Phil Arita. So I thought I wanted to be an antitrust law professor. When I got out of law school, I uh, was in a firm with another very fine antitrust practitioner. And I thought I wanted to be an antitrust practitioner. Then uh, by chance, I had a criminal trial, and I saw what criminal uh, lawyers did on both sides. And I thought, no, no, actually, I'd rather be a criminal lawyer. <laughs> um, so I went to the US Attorney's Office to be a prosecutor. And uh, I was all lined up to, to be doing that for uh, the rest of my life when totally by chance an opening occurred on the, on the Court of Appeals, and I ended up there. So had I planned this out in some way, I probably would have ended in some completely different place. So a thing I would say is to be open-minded about your opportunities, but to do the things that you are good at because you won't be happy if you're doing something that you're not, and do the things that you're happy at. So that's my first life lesson. And my second life lesson is one I'm sure I do not need to tell this group, uh, but that is the importance of family. They tell you in uh, Washington that if uh, you want a friend, get a dog. <laughs> Harry Truman said it. That is not true. What you <laughs> get a family. That is, uh, it's a hard place to be. Uh, no matter how much honor you have, uh, people will attack you uh, one way or the other. Um, and uh, the principal solace uh, that you get uh, is from your family, um, because they are behind you no matter what happens. Uh, so never forget about that. And so. Whatever interest you have in your career, you have to balance it with, uh, with a deep relationship with your family. And I think that's all my life lessons. Great, thank you. At that point, let's uh, open it for questions from, from the audience. And I think probably the best way is if you, uh, if you direct it to one of the panel members in particular, so. Well, that's it. All yeah. lessons learned. <laughs> Closing prayer will be offered by. Uh, it's hard for us yeah, to see. So if there's someone there, would you stand up and just start talking? I'm sorry, Judge Griffith. I'm up in the balcony. Oh, OK. Yeah. Great. That's where the lights are, so we can see you at all. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how, I want to be careful not to be political, uh, but uh, my personal view is we had a president a few years ago who was extraordinarily capable and successful, uh, but not honorable, and that was Bill Clinton. I'm not sure there'd be many people who would disagree with that. Um, let's put a dramatic example. Uh, I told you about a young man who was, but I will tell you who he is, actually. It's about time it became public. It was uh, Gene Scalia, who was Solicitor of Labor in the Bush administration and was pressed. He was a, uh, he was a recess appointment. <laughs> God help him if he, if Judge Griffith <laughs> got to him. Uh, but he was a recess appointment as Solicitor of Labor, and he was pressured to take a position on a political case, on a case for political reasons, and he refused uh, and resigned uh, after having first gone to White House counsel, Juan Albert Gonzalez, to complain. And Gonzalez, not surprisingly, did nothing, uh, given his record. And uh, J 
Gene resigned and went out quietly. Uh, there was some speculation that he might have uh, been pressured on a political matter, uh, but he never talked about it and went into a successful practice. And I've always been enormously impressed that as a young man who was um, very anxious to get his job permanently, he took what I thought was the honorable position. Um, why, to, as to why the term honor isn't used anymore, I don't really have a good answer. Uh, but you watch it. You see, if you looked 100 years ago at the paper, newspapers and you see people behave in a certain way and they're described as honorable or dishonorable, you don't see that anymore. And I think that tells you something about our society, but I'm not sure what the devil it is. May I add? May I add to I, I think this is a really important theme, and, and you really ought to track down the, the talk that uh, Judge Silberman gave about this to uh, the ABA. He told me this, this theme just a couple of weeks ago when our, we were having lunch together with our law, law clerks, and I was so taken with it that I asked him for the talk, and it's now required uh, something else new. It's now required reading in my chambers along with a turtle. That they get. And uh, no, it's really, really uh, uh, quite remarkable. It's made me to think about examples of that, of, of, uh, of, of honor. And I'm going to choose an example. The, uh, and it's, but again, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not political. It happened to be in a political setting. But, but I don't want anyone to misconstrue or misunderstand it. But my, one of my examples is somebody who's known to many people, Senator Gordon Smith, um, who was a, a junior senator from Oregon uh, at the time of the impeachment proceedings. Uh, he was uh, representing this, the state of Oregon, uh, which uh, uh, barely, you know, he, he, every time Gordon ran, he barely, Senator Smith ran, he barely held on to, uh, to, his, to his seat. And the impeachment was a, a highly charged political uh, issue in his state, and, and the folks had an overwhelming views in support of the president, overwhelming views in support of the president. Um, and he was facing re-election. And uh, he, I've, a, I've asked him for permission to tell this story because I'm, otherwise I'm revealing attorney-client privileges. But he came to me uh, early on in the process and he, you know, when I was working in the Senate and he said, look, uh, do you mind if on occasion we sit down and just sort of talk through the issues? Now, for staff, when the principal comes to you, do you mind sitting and talking about the, I thought, you name the time and place, Senator, and we'll do it. And so, on several occasions, we'd sit down and we'd talk through the issues. And he said, because I want to get this one right. He said, I want to get this one right. Um, and uh, I won't tell you which way uh, he cast his vote. That's not the, it's really not the important part of the story, but the motive to do it. Well, actually, this is the important part of the story, because he cast his votes in a way that was politically unpopular, and he didn't need to do it. He, he could have there was excuses for him to to vote a different way than he did, but he but he he did it the way he did because he 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 felt strongly about it, and he took a serious uh, uh, political hit. He survived it that time. Next time around, he he was not reelected. Um, for the younger folks out there, uh, I encourage you to get a book that all of us sort of grew up on. Uh, it was written by uh, then Senator uh, Jack Kennedy, uh, Profiles in Courage. It's a fabulous book, and it talks about this very principle of, of what people in public life do uh, when they're faced with these, uh, uh, these tough decisions. I, I remember when I was a, a boy, there was actually a TV series. I, don't think, I think it only lasted one season, but it was uh, Profiles and Courage, and so uh, I'd recommend getting that book and reading it. So. Uh Actually, I think that uh, Profiles and Courage is a good example on, on this issue, and I, I, there are lots of elements of honor, obviously, but uh, since we are in Washington, I would say that the principal element of honor that comes to my mind is doing what you think is the right thing, notwithstanding that your friends think it's wrong. That is, the hardest thing to do is to follow the law when the people who are your friends think should be in the opposite direction, Any, regardless of which party you're in or anything like that. And maybe in the example that um, 
Judge Griffith was giving, the senator does the right thing, notwithstanding the fact that in the end it means he can't be a senator anymore. Um, there's a lot of talk in Washington about courageously fighting for this thing or courageously fighting for this thing. But the thing that the people are always courageously fighting for is the thing that all of their friends want them to be courageously fighting for. <laughs> now, that's not to say it's the wrong thing to fight for, but it doesn't take any courage to do what everybody around you uh, thinks you should be doing. The, the hard things are when you have to uh, make, uh, make your friends disappointed because uh, you think you've, you're, you're required, for example, by the law to do something that maybe is different than what you would do as a matter of public policy. A question for Judge Garland. Uh, I was heartened to hear you uh, list family as one of the uh, uh, life principles. Uh, many of us, of course, uh, feel similarly that families are very important. And I'm, I'm curious, one of the challenges I think uh, many of us have is uh, balance and balancing between career and the enormous demands of career, family, the enormous demands the family puts on it, and faith and, and all of that. And then trying to keep a balance is always a challenge. I'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts are regarding keeping a balance and uh, being successful in all facets. Yeah, so it's very hard, obviously, particularly for lawyers, particularly for lawyers in public positions because of the, of the <coughs> stresses of work and the amounts of work, and, and no doubt also for lawyers in, in private practice. Um, and there is no, I think there's no one answer to this question, just like there's no one answer to how you should go about your career. Um, I mean, for myself, the balance came from always driving my children to school so that every day, you know, we had the, that, that first half hour, 45 minutes of nothing but uninterrupted time. Sometimes it was just a bunch of sarcasm. Sometimes it was just listening to the radio, uh, but sometimes it was real explanation of what the kids were thinking and what they were worrying about. And to have, to be able to put aside some amount of time, whatever it is, uh, unpressured, this isn't the time we have to talk, this is just time we have. Um, and different people can do it in different ways, depending on which way you have, have time. Um, another thing is to make certain kinds of trade-offs. Um, I mean, I, I don't want in any way to pretend that like I come home at five o'clock and, and I don't leave until 10 in the morning. That's just not my way. I mean, I work very hard. Um, but something- it's my way. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the benefits of being a senior judge. That was, that was not his way before he became one. And I look forward to that uh, position. Um, you know, another thing is to make trade-offs. When I was uh, young and unmarried, I wanted to have all the trial practice experience I could. And when I was at my firm, I said, I'll go anywhere for a trial. Um, and so, you know, I spent one entire winter in Helena, Montana, at minus 50 degrees, because I said I would go anywhere to be on trial. So, and I was. Um, uh, but when we started having kids, um, I said, you know, really what I want to do is be here and not travel. And in my current job, um, I just turn down, you know, un in, unless it happens to be in Salt Lake City on a week when I want to go skiing. <laughs> um, I gener that's a joke, sort of. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I, I don't travel. Uh, we take all of our vacations with our children. We've never actually taken a vacation by ourselves. Um, so uh, so that's one set of ways to, to make this arrangement. Another thing, uh, Walter Dellinger, who was the um, head of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Clinton administration, told me he thinks of his life as a flex life. That is not flex time. It's too hard as a lawyer sometimes to have flex time, but to have flex life. You go through certain periods when you have the opportunity to do public service, for example, and you work 24 hours a day, and then you retreat into, in his case, into uh, you know, being a professor where you can spend much more time, free time with the family. Um, it's pe I think people have to balance this all different ways. There isn't any one way. Um, and the only thing that's important is you recognize the importance of family and of you know, bonding with your spouse and your children so that when you are apart, you don't feel apart. May I add something on that? 
As long as it's not rebuttal. Yeah. No, it's not a rebuttal. <laughs> um, there is an interesting dichotomy uh, with respect to that question, a dichotomy of age. For instance, I got married in the 50s. Uh, and for all of its negative aspects with respect to the opportunities for women, uh, it was typical, if not universal, that well-educated women, my first wife, would be primarily mothers and the guardians of the family. Uh, and in this respect, I regard myself as very lucky because it wasn't until uh, after the uh, women's liberation movement developed, and it wasn't until the 70s or 80s that she, became, that she pursued a career. So therefore, she had the primary responsibility to keep the family together and to support her husband working hard. It was much easier to have a uniform family life back in those days. The price, of course, was that women didn't have opportunities in the workplace. Nowadays, particularly for young people, I find it terribly difficult and watch over and over again as my clerks uh, and other uh, young pe lawyers, married to lawyers, try to figure out how the devil they balance <clears throat> two careers and a family life. And I have no idea how they do it. Well, this is the, the, the fourth point I had because I was anticipating this question because it comes up not, not just with settings of the Clark Society, but I, vir virtually wherever I go, and when speaking particularly to law students, this is a huge problem, a challenge, because you want to have balance in your life. And, uh, and I'm not going to pretend to you that I'm a perfect example uh, of this. Uh, uh, I do remember reading an essay by Calvin Trillin once. He said, the whole world is divided into two, pe two groups people for whom their family is their center of their life and, and everyone else. So that, that kind of, you, you just, you make it work, uh, even though it, you may not work perfectly. But I, but I have some advice for this group in particular that might be a little bit different than what my colleagues just said, but it's along the same lines, but it's adapted to your particular circumstances. And here's my advice to you. Uh, whatever else the issues are, be fully fully engaged in the life of your ward. That's the, our local LDS uh, congregation. Be fully involved. Uh, throw yourself into it. Uh, be available to clean the chapel. Uh, be available to work with the scouts, work with the young women. Go to the, to the Relief Society socials. Uh, just throw, outside of your family, uh, I would strongly encourage you to make your ward life your the primary place where you spend your time and energy. And here's why. And here's why. Uh, each of you is at great risk because you have chosen the law uh, as as your profession. And if if you were here last night and heard uh, uh, Elder Holland tell that story about uh, uh, BYU, former BYU President Ernest L. Wilkinson, who was disgusted by the work product of someone who had not been trained in the law, you know the hubris that often comes with our, with our training. And, and so, so here's the test. When you're sitting in Sunday school class on Sunday and the teacher is not as learned as you are and says some really squirrely things, <laughs> this, is, this is not uncommon experience, I, I can tell you, and, 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 and you think because of your training, because of your experience, that you know better than that person. That is your canary in the mine shaft. Something is fundamentally wrong with who you are. Uh, so repent, right? Don't, don't, you know, don't get discouraged about it. Change, right? Um, Elder Hartman Rector used to say, you know, when you, when you mess up, don't get, don't get too discouraged about it. You can always be used as a bad example. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. So, but don't, so don't be a bad example on that. And, and they, they, so, uh, just as, you know, a story from my life where I'm the hero. Is that okay? I tell you. But I, it, not infrequently, when I was, uh, I can remember this experience when I was at my, uh, as a partner in a law firm in D.C. And it'd be Monday morning. People would uh, come in and uh, 
meet in the uh, the break room and they had a special little cache of hot chocolate for me and everyone else had their coffee and you're standing around talking I can remember one discussion that went like this uh, you know what would you all do for the weekend this one fellow said well, you know my you know my wife and I uh, we actually flew out to San Diego to uh, uh, there was some art exhibit or something oh, that's, that's kind of idea. where'd you go well we went up to New York for the opera and and uh, the other ones went to Annapolis for uh, sailing for the weekend. They said, what did you do, Tom? And I thought where I had been and what I had seen by virtue of the fact that I was a bishop of a really, really bad ward. <laughs> the, the fact that I was a bishop shows you something about the level of strength that was available. And, uh, and, and, and I had spent the weekend in public housing projects, visiting with with people and seeing things that I, and maybe this is arrogant of me, that I was pretty certain that none of those other folks had ever visited in their life, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and I thought, there's no way I can communicate to them what I had done. I wasn't embarrassed by it, but it just, you know, it's like, you know, it's the, the, from the Love and Spoonful, like trying to tell a preacher about rock and roll, and it just, it wouldn't work. And so I said, I lied. I just said, oh, you know, I just hung out with the family. And, uh, and I had in part, but I had, and those experiences uh, are, for me, more important than, than anything else. And, and they're, hope, they, I don't know if they've worked with me, but there's some tether uh, to reality, to, uh, to understanding that, uh, no, in fact, it's the least of these who are his brethren, they should be our brethren. If they're not, if your circle of friends is, are people just like you, well-educated, articulate, intellectual, um, I think you're missing out on something, and, and I, think it's, I think it's really dangerous. So I would throw to that, in addition to, for this group, in addition to the Life Family, man, you be there cleaning up the chapel, okay? And uh, uh, you be there cleaning the toilets in the chapel, okay? Uh, we don't have toilets in our chapel. It's in the building. <laughs> it's, it's in the building, but there are toilets in the building. But it's not. So, uh, so that's my, my advice. No, no, I was never chief judge. No, no, uh, thank God. <laughs> the, the, the question was, uh, just this last week, uh, uh, Judge Garland has become Chief Judge Garland, and the question is, what he, what he learned from his predecessor to prepare him for this, what his new responsibilities are, and then, and then for uh, Judge Silberman, what he has noticed about chief judges over the years. Well, I'll say what I said. We had a good, sort of a, not a goodbye party, but a transition party to thank Judge, Chief Judge Sentel for his service. Uh, uh, the main thing I've learned oh, wait, is... Wait, I have to interrupt here. I have to add some color. So the, 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 uh, the, the dress of the day, as you may know, uh, Chief Judge Sentel is a character, wears a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and so people were encouraged to bring cowboy hats and cowboy boots. Uh, because it's a non-smoking building, no one was allowed to bring a cigar. But our new chief judge, in fact, you can, hard to imagine this, was, was wearing a, a cowboy hat. <laughs> cowboy hat. So. He, I, he didn't bring it today, I noticed. But. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this was in honor of Judge Sentel. We don't wear cowboy hats in Illinois. Um, so uh, I, I, what I said was the uh, uh, principal thing I've realized about my new job is that um, we are on a um, uh, river. Um, I'm on the uh, boat. Uh, Judge Santel has uh, passed the tiller to me um, just uh, a week or two before we go over the rapids of the sequester. <laughs> And I would have blamed him, uh, you know, that he did this intentionally, except he actually is 70 years old, and that's on that day, and that was the last day that, uh, that he could serve. Uh, so I would say uh, the main thing I, uh, uh, I have to worry about, um, uh, about what might otherwise have been a pleasant job being chief judge, is uh, 
is uh, negotiating the rapids of the sequester. Um, we are a small organization, uh, relatively, I don't know, about 150 or so uh, employees and staff, et cetera. Um, and we are like a family. The court is, uh, the judges of the court are extraordinarily collegial, uh, and the staff of the court are very much uh, uh, sort of a family part of the enterprise. Um, and if the sequester goes forward, uh, it means the same thing it means everywhere else in the government that um, we're going to have to make some very hard decisions about how many employees we can have. And this is, this is the part of being the chief judge I do not look forward to in the slightest. Uh, the part that I do look forward to is the part where, for the first time, I'll be the senior member of the panel. I was the junior member of the panel for seven years nobody having been appointed after me for seven years, which gives you an idea of what the struggles for confirmation are like in, in Washington. Uh, the, uh, the assignments of cases within a panel, not to the panel, but within a panel for writing, are done in order. So the most senior judge gets to pick the case that he or she would like to write. The next one gets to pick the one that he or she would like to write. And the third one gets the last one. So uh, I think there will be some advantage to being the senior judge on the panel. I, I think, I think the, the public at large has seen the last opinion ever written by Judge Garland on energy law. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. I, I would give you some observations about this. Uh, there was a time 20-some years ago when uh, relations amongst judges on our court were quite contentious. Uh, judge Edwards became chief judge, and we had a session, and uh, I told him that on administrative matters, uh, I thought he should have great deference, and that I personally would be willing to support him no matter what on any administrative matter, because my theory of management of law firms or courts is you're always better off having decisions made by one person, man or woman, whoever is senior, than you are collectively. I remember years ago when I was a partner at Steptoe and Johnson, there was a discussion with respect to the new building as to whether the library would be on the eighth floor, seventh floor, or sixth floor. And I was totally astonished that we went through, through three or four days of desperate argument as to whether the library would be on. I seriously took the floor and said, the management of the firm should be given to the least competent lawyer, and we were much better off than trying to decide this collectively. Uh, that wasn't totally accepted. Uh, <laughs> but, but it is still my view uh, of the organization like the court. Now, that's not to suggest that Judge Garland is the least competent. Uh, <laughs> But even if he were, which he is not, we'd be better off just delegating all the administrative matters to uh, the chief. And we do generally have followed that practice ever since Judge Edwards was chief judge, and we've had a much happier court and a much more efficient court. Now, that's by way of telling you that lawyers, if they <coughs> are trying to decide collectively decisions, are lousy managers. And there's also <coughs> buried within his comment uh, um, an acknowledgement of a serious deficit. It's hard to imagine a deficit in Judge Silberman's career, but, but there is one, and he shares it with Judge Garland. Uh, they've, they've never served uh, in the legislative branches. They, they saw, they, that was supposed to be a joke. You get, yeah, the, one, per, joke, you, you get what he's saying. Be a deficit. What, one person making a decision doesn't like, anyway, that's us. <laughs> This is, I mentioned this because Judge uh, Silberman and I have this uh, long running, uh, uh, it's not a feud, it's a joke, but he always tweaks me suspecting that, uh, that I don't give proper respect to the, uh, let's see, it's, it's in Article 2, isn't it? Yes. It's Article, it's the second. Actually, article. there's an interesting divide amongst federal judges, I've noticed. If you've served in the executive branch and only in the executive branch in the government, it doesn't matter which party you were in you come out of it with a, with a profound distaste for the Congress. Um, I want to make clear, there's been a number of times here when I've been silent, when Judge Silverman has said things. I do not mean my silence to be assent. <laughs> he's, he's, too, he, he's too careful. But the truth of the matter, 
But Griffith told me to be careful. You heard that. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you've served in the legislative branch, you're much more tolerant of the Congress as an institution. Uh, although you wouldn't notice, and you notice that by Judge Griffith's most recent decision. <laughs> Please, please, another question? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chief Justice Bud Jones from the Arizona Supreme Court. I think there are some here who might I, I, I know it's quite different between personality here on the fire. I hope so. Can I use the mic? It would be interesting to know how you use your law clerks. What do you have to do? The the, the question was, he's, uh, uh, Judge Jones has noticed some difference in personalities amongst the panel members and how, do they, uh, how we use our law clerks. Uh, so. He's looking at me. Okay. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I um, this is a pro maybe this is a mentoring issue, but you know, my, the first judge I worked for was Judge Friendly, and in many ways I model my work with my law clerks in the way that he did. Um, so um, I don't have my law clerks do bench memos um, because I'm going to read all the briefs. I'm going to read the cases. I'm going to read parts of the record. Um, and I, do, I think it's not a good use of their time to write 20 beautiful pages, explain to me what the briefs say, since I'm, I'm going to read them myself anyway. And I also find that I want an unfiltered view of what the litigants are arguing. Um, whenever you have somebody else explain to you what the litigants are arguing, it's through their own you know, filter, and sometimes it's correct and sometimes it's not, but I have to understand it directly. Uh, now, my law clerks are not always able to contain themselves, and so sometimes they write me memos anyway. <laughs> um, we now have a rule that if they write me something more than three pages, I have to get my special permission <laughs> to do it. Um, but I, I did try that in the beginning, and it turned out I was just reading another brief and it wasn't worthwhile. So what happens is my clerks read all the briefs, all the cases cited in the briefs. I urge them to think outside of the box of the briefs because the lawyers often are the ones who argued the case in the district court and they get themselves in a particular doctrinal mindset, which may be incorrect, because in the pressures of working very fast in a trial court, you may not have thought about the other strands of legal doctrine that actually govern the case. Uh, so that, to think outside, to look at cases outside, to read the entire record. Then I read uh, the briefs, I read uh, all the cases, although hopefully I have read some of those before. And as I'm only lately telling my clerks, hopefully I've written some of those before. Uh, having now been on the court for about 16 years, Judge Silverman has written many more, having been on the court way longer. So a lot of times I'm just rereading his opinion. Um, and now I'll be reading uh, Judge Griffiths, although he's been on less than me. I read the parts of the record that uh, the parties tell me to read, that my law clerks tell me to read, and that, that I have an intuition are in the record. and. Um, neither, neither has told me to read. So this often happens that in a, for, in a criminal case, for example, I think I should read the pre-sentence report even though people don't, haven't pointed that out or the closing argument to, to the jury or the um, indictment, uh, which often tell me things that uh, um, make the case a lot clearer than, uh, and maybe they're assumed by the writers. Um, and then, um, my method is very much uh, verbal. Um, I uh, have strategically placed, I, I am embarrassed to say this in front of this group, but the coffee pot, <laughs> I, I have it at the end of our chamber so that I have to walk all the way past my clerks. And every time I walk by, I ask them what they're working on and how they're progressing on the case and what they're thinking about. I need to think about a case several times during the period <laughs> Uh, in the period before the oral argument. Um, and then in the week uh, before the oral argument, we get together and we just argue it out. Um, I pick clerks who are willing to say no to me and uh, in a nice way, um, who, you know, who can say that's wrong, judge, and this is the reason why. Um, I think the most important thing that a clerk can do for a judge, I, say, I tell my clerks, is to prevent me from jumping off the cliff um, if I don't want to. 
That is, you know, sometimes I don't realize there's a cliff there at all, that the implications of what I'm doing are really totally wrong. And uh, sometimes it takes another person or two other people to warn me that, uh, you know, you're just not reading this case correctly or you're just not understanding the implications of what a decision in this way would be. Now, in the end, it's unfortunately my choice. I have to make that decision, but I wanted to be completely educated. We have what I think is a very nice tradition in our court, which is we vote right after the oral argument. It's a tentative vote. Anybody can always change their mind, but it means we have to be completely prepared by the time of the oral argument to make at least a tentative decision. Um, and that, that's a very good thing because it means oral argument can be as effective as possible. Um, and then I find, uh, again, like Judge Friendly, that I have to write myself. At least I have to write the first draft or a detailed first outline or I have to throw away whatever a clerk has written and start over again. Uh, because I find for myself, and this is really a question of comparative advantage in a certain way, that I need, I can make somebody else's work look pretty or smooth or stylistic, but I can't understand the underlying logic of an argument if I don't write it myself first. Um, and then the times when I've tried to do it the other way, um, and then I start unpacking a paragraph, I realize there's a problem with it. So I tell my clerks in the current vernacular, they should not feel dissed if I don't use any of their, of their language, uh, because I just, that's just the way I think I have to do that. Now, then my clerks have plenty of exercise on the editorial side, and we trade back and forth and back and forth. We do um, at least 10 drafts, maybe more, uh, on the computer with me doing a draft and them doing a, um, an edit indicating what they propose and me undoing their edit and sending it back to them. We then uh, print it out and in double space do another five or so drafts um, at a stand-up desk standing next to, to each other. This is from an experience that our, our, our uh, joint friend, Judge Silver, one of my uh, Professor Arita, um, I worked on his antitrust treatise. We stood next to each other at a desk working line by line both substantively and stylistically as to the meaning of each line, arguing it back and forth. Um, and then actually, of course, finally we do issue opinions. Uh, but that, that, that's the route. Sometimes there are fewer drafts, sometimes there are many more drafts. Oh, and then, and the great thing about this court is then we, we don't just issue an opinion, I shouldn't have said it that way. We then circulate it to the other members of the panel. And I say the great thing about our court is that people feel free to say, you know, what about this? I, you know, I think this paragraph would be better if it were this way, usually not stylistic, but substantively. Sometimes people will say, I can agree with, you know, you've given me two reasons uh, to come out in a certain way, and um, um, I only agree with one. Will you reduce it to the one? And I think uh, Judge Silverman and I, uh, Judge uh, Griffiths and I know from a recent experience where Judge Griffith has been willing to do that, that this, make, this is sort of the creation of collegiality on our court, I think, which is, you know, everybody doesn't reach for the most, the position that they would most like. They don't give up, they don't give up their views about what the